Alright lads, today we are once again doing a guide for helicopters in War Thunder. I wasn't happy with the last one, and I want to make this one a bit more professional. War Thunder has many different types of helicopters, from light recon choppers to heavy gunships. They all have different flying characteristics, abilities and weaponry. If you'd like to know more about the role of helicopters in this game, and how to use them effectively, stick around for the rest of the video. Currently in War Thunder, there are several game modes available for helicopters. Sim battles, where they can be used as a first spawn. Ground realistic battles, where they can be spawned with spawn points. With this system, the more advanced weapons you equipped, the more spawn points it will cost to actually spawn. We also have a PvE game mode, our player versus environment. This game mode consists of one team of players fighting AI controlled ground units. While it is a good place to learn helicopters, it isn't great for grinding them. And finally, helicopters can be used in Assault Ground Arcade, which is similar to the Heli PvE, except your teammates can be both tanks and helicopters. These are the only game modes available where you can earn RP and Silver Lions while flying a helicopter. That brings us on to actually unlocking your first helicopter. Other than buying a premium, the only way to unlock a chopper in game is to unlock either rank 5 tank or a rank 5 plane in a tech tree which has a helicopter line. For example, if you wanted to unlock the American helicopter tree, you first would need to unlock any rank 5 vehicle, either in the American Ur tree or the American ground tree. This will then unlock the first American helicopter, but you will still have to purchase it with Silver Lions. As I said though, you could purchase one of the many premium helicopters, which obviously gives you access right away, without having to grind. I'm not recommending you spend your money on premium helicopters, but suspiciously in War Thunder, for many nations, their most effective helicopters are the premiums, looking at UK 50 and Swedish Mi-28. Anyway, now we know how to unlock a helicopter, let's go over the different types of choppers you will likely encounter in the average tech tree. We'll start with the AH-1G. For many players, this will likely be their first helicopter. This chopper represents the first generation of attack helicopters, made popular for their mobility and loiter times over the jungles of Vietnam. They have rather outdated weaponry, at least compared to the top tier helicopters. They also have a pretty low power to weight ratio, as well as being very delicate, making them very sensitive to damage. These helicopters are typical of the starting choppers of each nation. While they are good to learn the basics, the weaponry and tactics of these helicopters are quickly made redundant by the following classes of helicopters. While the AH-1G which we just spoke about is stuck with basic rocket weaponry, this isn't true for all of the starter helicopters in War Thunder. Some nations, like Germany, Russia, France and the UK, all have starter helicopters that get access to two or more anti-tank guided missiles, crucially giving you standoff capabilities. This means you don't have to get close to enemy tanks to actually kill them, theoretically keeping you out of harm's way. The mid-tier helicopters of all nations tend to be fast, lightly armed, and poorly armoured. They tend to have 4 to 8 anti-tank guided missiles, with ranges between 3 to 6 kilometres, allowing you to stay further away from the battlefield. But for balance, they have higher battle ratings, exposing you to the more advanced air defence systems found at the top tier of a nation's ground tree. Examples of these helicopters are the Lynx in the British tree, the B0105 in the German tree, and the AH-1Fs in the American tree. We have two other types of mid-tier helis. Currently in the French tree, we have the two gazelles. These are incredibly fast, small, and lightly armed helicopters. In real life, they are scout or recce helicopters. Not really attack helicopters, but they are fun to fly, but due to only being able to carry two ATGMs on the early model, and four on the latter, they aren't too effective in game. The polar opposite to the gazelles, however, are the Soviet gunships. These are the Mi-24 Hinds, of Afghanistan fame. They are big, fast, but very unagile. They are hard to manoeuvre, especially at low speeds, and don't respond well to your input. They have a lot of firepower, 
but can sometimes struggle to put the firepower to work due to their poor maneuverability. We'll cover all of this in depth later, so don't worry if I'm using terms that you don't quite understand. And finally, we have the modern attack helicopters, such as the American Apache and the Soviet Ka-52 and Mi-28. These helicopters have many advanced features, mainly in the form of sensor suites. They usually also have thermal imaging and advanced weaponry. Due to their desired tactic of shooting and scooting, they also tend to be agile and fast. With that overview complete, let's get into the flying. Let's start with the controls. For the purposes of this video, I'm going to click on a premium helicopter and go into a test drive. But feel free to follow along with whichever helicopter you want. My personal control layout is based upon having a mouse with several programmable buttons, as well as a keyboard with a numpad. Anyway, once we're into a test drive, click the escape button on your keyboard and then move the mouse to the control section. First, make sure that the control mode drop down menu is set to mouse aim. I then recommend setting the hover mode control to whatever you like. I use number six on my keypad. This control enters the chopper into an auto hover mode. Next is the collective pitch. Double click on this option and basically copy all of the settings that you see on my screen. To put it simply, with this layout, the shift key will make the helicopter increase in altitude and the control key will make it descend in altitude. We then have the hover height controls. Same again, copy my settings. This control is used for altering the height of our helicopter when it is in the keypad number six hovering mode. And below that, for the roll, pitch and yaw axis, I'd again simply recommend you copy what I have. These controls are similar to the controls for planes and tanks and don't require you to train muscle memory by having a new set of controls. It basically just utilizes the WASD keys. We then want to go down to the camera controls. I don't recommend you copy my setup here. As I said, I have a mouse with programmable buttons and most of my camera options are served by one button on said mouse. Change these to whatever you'd like. But there is one trick you should know about. You may notice that my toggle view, external view, and shooter view are all bound to the same key, the R key. If you select all these three options with any button of your choosing, it allows you to quickly change between the two of these camera views, the external view for flying and the shooter view for firing and guiding ATGMs, which again, I will cover later on in the video. In my opinion, the other camera options aren't useful and I personally never use them. Also make sure to set your sight stabilization key I have this bound to the Z key, but that is macroed again to my mouse. So choose whatever is best for you. Also important is the disable sight stabilization key. I have this set to the Alt key just below the WASD keys, mainly because it is so accessible. Again, set these keys to whatever bind you would like. Again, I'll cover the sight stabilization in the weapon section later on in the video. But first, let's do some flying. Hit escape a few times, and we'll find ourselves back on the helipad. If we press the 6 key or the hover mode button and then hold the shift key, our helicopter should start to rise. Once above the ground, press the control key and look at the UI on the right hand side of the screen. You'll notice a bar with several notches in it, as well as a moving arrow. This arrow indicates the altitude changes of the helicopter. If we keep the arrow in the middle, again altering it up or down, with the shift and control key respectively, we can keep the helicopter stationary in the air. This is a simple maneuver, good for learning how to climb and descend. While we're up here though, let's test our pitch, roll and yaw controls. If you hold the Q key, you should yaw to the left and the E key, yaw to the right. If we hold the A key, our helicopter should roll to the left and the D key, roll to the right. And finally, holding the W key, our helicopter should nose forward and the S key dip by the tail. If we press the hover mode button again, number six on our keypad, we will be free to fly around. This is where many people struggle with helicopters. Instead of using the WASD keys for simple movements, helicopters fly with gyros. Unlike cars, which are connected to the ground via the tires, or planes, which are connected to the atmosphere with the control surfaces, helicopters don't really have moving parts like aerofoils or rudders. Instead, it is changes in the input to the gyro that controls the helicopter's movement. This gives them much less control over inertia compared to cars or planes. 
Flying a helicopter is like driving a car on ice. This isn't the best of analogies, but I hope you understand what I'm trying to say. Helicopters can be a little rough to learn. Anyway, to fly forwards, lower your mouse down slightly. The nose of the helicopter will begin to dip. As it dips, it will start flying forwards, but it will also drop in altitude. To compensate for this, give the shift key a few taps. Again, while flying forwards, try to alter the arrow on the right hand side of the UI and keep it in the center. This will allow us to move forwards while maintaining the roughly the same altitude. Try and fly around for a bit and just get used to it. After you are confident with that, let's talk about the other UI visible. Starting with the left hand side of the screen. At the top, we have an RPM monitor. RPM, or revolutions per minute, determines the speed of the rotor blades. Helicopters use a fixed rotor speed. The only thing that moves on a helicopter, if things go well, is a pitch of the rotors themselves. That is the call writing underneath the RPM. Call stands for collective. This is the pitch of the rotors. The higher the collective, the more lift the helicopter will produce. But a high collective puts a lot of stress on the rotors, as there is more air resistance. So increasing the collective too fast can stall the engine, leading to a loss of thrust. Again, it's kind of like trying to start a car in fifth gear. So always add power slowly, especially in the larger Soviet gunship helicopters. Under the call is the speed tab. Pretty straightforward here really. It just indicates the speed of the aircraft. And then in the middle of the screen, we can see two lines with a W looking line in the middle. The two outside lines represent an artificial horizon and the W shows you the aircraft's position relative to this horizon. If you press the A or D key, you'll notice the W moving. We also have a line with an arrow on it. As I said, helicopters have inertia. This line with an arrow is showing us the current inertia of the helicopters. If we fly forwards and then hold the Q or the E key, you'll see that even though we turn the helicopter, the inertia is still dragging us in the initial direction of flight. Some helicopters are affected much more by this inertia. The smaller helicopters in game, like the Gazelle, are much easier to control due to their relatively low weight. The Soviet Hinds on the other hand are very heavy and carry much more inertia. Rather than a car driving on ice, some of the Soviet helicopters feel like driving an 18 wheeler on ice. Because of this inertia, it is best to fly helicopters like top tier jets. Try and stay fast, going from point to point. Trying to make sharp turns is going to make you bleed all of your speed, make you very vulnerable to enemy air defense systems, and dramatically increases the likelihood of you crashing, mainly due to that rotor stall. Again, this is worst on the larger Soviet helicopters. So try and stay fast. If you miss a shot or overshoot a target, just fly past it, extend, and then turn around when it's safe. But how do we stop our helicopter safely? Well, if you press the 6 key while in flight, it will enter the hover mode and stop the helicopter for you automatically. But this takes a long time and leaves you incredibly vulnerable. The fastest way, other than crashing of course, is to hold control, cutting all lift, and pointing the nose of the aircraft upwards with the S key. When you start to lose most of your speed, don't forget to add lift by pressing the shift key. This is all very complicated in theory, but once you start flying around, it's really easy. And when you get an hour or two flying with a certain helicopter underneath your belt, you'll learn exactly when to add or cut lift, as well as when to turn. Now, an advanced maneuver, a quick stop. This can only be done by the lighter helicopters in game. When you're traveling at speed and want to stop quickly, hold the S key in flight. When you can see the top of your rotor blades, hold the control key, cutting lift. Then, once you can see the belly of your helicopter, hold the A or the D key, rowing the helicopter back to the correct way up. Finally, add a healthy chunk of lift with the shift key, and just like that, you're pretty much stopped dead. Granted, you will be facing the wrong direction, but this is easily sorted. That's basic flying for arcade and realistic, now let's go on to some sim controls. So, flying in sim, it's not as hard as you might think. The hardest part is that you don't get a third person camera and you are forced to use a mouse joystick. The mouse joystick basically mimics the input of an actual joystick, albeit for some reason the inputs are inverted. With that done, let's go back into a test drive. Make sure to enter a simulator test drive rather than a realistic one. I'm using the American AH-1G which is basically stock 
so it should give you a decent representation as your first flight in a sim helicopter. Anyway, let's go back into the controls. Escape and then controls. In the top, click on the full real controls. If you followed my control guide in the previous section, then there is only one setting we need to change. Go down to the control section and find the toggle SAS button. Again, set this to whatever you like. I have it set to full stop on my keypad. Hit escape a few times until you get back onto the helipad. Now that we're out of the controls, you'll notice that you have a large circle in the middle of the cockpit. This is mimicking the control radius of a joystick, with the default zero input being in the center. If we press the toggle SAS button, again, mine is full stop on the keypad, you'll notice that our helicopter now enters a dampening mode. This basically removes the sensitivity from the controls, making it much easier to add input without adding too much. Just like in the previous section, taking off and flying is exactly the same. Hold shift to take off. Once in the air, if you move our cursor down, the nose of the aircraft will drop. Point the mouse up, the nose rises. As I said, it's just like using an inverted joystick. Sim is much more complicated compared to realistic, but to put it simply, the helicopter will fly in whatever direction you are pointing your cursor. But, it doesn't mean the nose of the helicopter will also fly in this direction. If we put the mouse down slightly, the helicopter will start to fly forwards. Unlike flying in realistic, in sim, you will need to use your WASD keys, as well as the Q and E keys a lot. This is to basically trim out the aircraft in flight. There's no real easy way to explain how to fly, so just take off and try to fly in a straight level line. Just like in realistic, remember to use the arrows and altimeter UI to keep yourself level in flight. After practicing that for a bit and once you're confident, put the cursor either to the left or to the right a little bit and then counter with roll in the opposite direction. For example, I'm holding the mouse to the left and pressing the D key. This allows me to both yaw and bank to the left. You could also do this by just holding the Q or E keys, but you have far more control while using the mouse joystick and the WASD keys. Again, flying in sim is a lot more of feeling than actually flying. There's a very large input lag inherent to helicopters, and you have to know how the helicopter is going to react. Because of this, I'd recommend just flying around in the test drive until you've got the basics down. Just like riding a bike, you can't really learn from watching. You have to get on that thing and just ride it. You are going to crash. Hell, I fly sim helis a lot and I still crash, but I promise you will learn and it isn't too bad once you get the hang of it. The difficulty comes when you stop merely trying to fly, but try to fight and fly. Onwards comrades, to the radar section. This section will be relevant to both sim and realistic. There is no difference in performance between game modes, so this section is used for both. Another thing to point out is that most helicopters in game don't even have radar, so this is a little niche and only really applies to the top tier helicopters. Again, if we go into a test drive, hit the escape key and open up the controls. In the text bar at the top of the screen, type in radar. Here, we have several keys which we need to bind. Again, I use my keypad. I suggest you do as well. Starting with the first control, which turns our radar on and off. I have this set to the number one key. Change radar mode is set to the two key. Change radar search mode is set to the three key. And to actually use the radar, we need to set a control for select radar target to lock. For me, this is set to the four key. And finally, to lock a target, bind the lock radar target on the 5 key. After we have these set, back out with escape into the test drive. By default, a radar equipped helicopter will come with its radar on, but if we hit the 1 key, it will turn it off. Hit the 1 key again, and it turns back on. I'm currently flying in the Apache Longbow, which has several radar modes. If we hit the 2 key, we change from an air to ground mode to an air to air mode. The air to air mode is pretty useless in game in terms of offensive capabilities. There are no semi-active radar homing missiles for helicopters, but it can alert you to the presence of enemy air assets. The air to ground mode is a little bit more useful though, but still largely a gimmick. Anyway, we'll cover it shortly. If we press the 2 key again and go back into the air to ground mode, you can see that we have a vertical line scanning from left to right. This is an animated representation of a search radar. It moves left to right, 
scanning for targets. By pressing the 3 key, we can limit the search zone for that radar. This allows you to scan a precise area if you wanted to, but it isn't real useful in game. If we keep pressing the 3 key, our radar will return to its full scan size. Here, you will notice several bars within this search window. These are radar contacts, potential enemy targets. If we press the 4 key, you will see a pipper moving between each of these contacts. This is essentially how we designate a target for the radar. If we then press the 5 key, our radar will lock onto whatever object our pipper is over. Put simply, the 4 key changes which target you want to select, and the 5 key locks onto a target. Radar can be used as a way to rapidly acquire a target, but again, generally, it is largely a gimmick, and trying to press all the radar buttons whilst in the air, and trying to counter enemy spags, is a little difficult. Anyway boys, onto the weaponry. But first, let's go over a few basic controls before we get onto the subject of weaponry. Again, if we open the control tab, make sure you're in the helicopter settings, and click on the weaponry section. I think it's easier to set up all of our controls in one go, rather than going back and forth throughout the video. Again, same caveats as the other control sections. Feel free to change any of the binds, use whatever is easiest for you. First, set the keybinds for the small caliber guns, large caliber guns, and additional guns. I have these set to the same key, pretty obviously the left mouse button. Then, set the fire secondary weapon key. This is responsible for launching weapons like air to ground missiles. I have this set to the space bar. You can also scroll down a bit and find the switch secondary weapon keybind. This control will allow you to cycle throughout your weapons and fire them all with the space bar. However, I don't really like this as it feels too clunky and I prefer to have all my weapon systems bound to different keys. Now, you may prefer to keep them all in your spacebar, but that choice is up to you. Anyway, carrying on, we want to set a bind for the drop bomb key. I have this set to the 3 key, located above the WASD keys. This is basically only used on Soviet helicopters. Below the drop bomb key, we have the rocket binds. We actually have two of them. We have fire rockets and fire rocket salvo. The former will fire a pair of rockets, the latter will fire several salvos at once. The salvo section gives you a better chance of hitting a target, but burns through ammunition faster. I have both of these keys bound to my mouse, so I'll pick a key binding equally as accessible. Below this, we have the air to air weapon lock. Just set this to the 4 key. This is only used to turn off your heat seeking missile, I'll explain it later on. Up next is the exit selected weapon mode. Again, set this to the left ALT key. It just cancels your current targeting system. Again, covered in more depth shortly. Below this, we want to set our toggle laser designator to the L key. This again is only really used for one weapon system. Nearing the end of the controls now, scroll down to the fire air to ground missile key. Again, I have this set to the space bar. Below that, we have the fire air to air missile. I have this set to a key on my mouse. And although this band says fire air to air, it can also be used to spool up the seeker before launch. In my opinion, negating the air to air weapon lock key from earlier. Five last binds, and then we're onto the weapons themselves. Set both the toggle cannons ballistic computer and toggle rocket ballistic computer to the backslash key, to the left of the keyboard. This is very important, as it is our CCIP, which is used to accurately fire cannons, bombs, and rockets. Then, we have the toggle site stabilization, and disable stabilization. I have the former set to the Z key, which again is macro to my mouse. The disable key is set to the left alt again, just like the exit selected weapon mode. This allows you to exit all weapon targeting modes and site stabilization with one press of the alt key. And finally, scroll right to the bottom and find the switch NVD mode key. This basically allows you to switch between color, night vision, and thermal imaging as long as your helicopter is equipped with such devices. I have this set to the X key. You'll notice that all of the major key binds are either set to my mouse or located very close to the WASD keys, meaning I don't really need to take my hand off the mouse when flying. The only exception to this is the radar, which is set to my numpad. But as I said, radar is a bit gimmicky and you aren't really going to be using it while flying. All right. So we're in a test drive with my nice modern attack chopper. We're going to go over the basics of targeting. 
if we take off and bring the helicopter to a hover, vaguely facing the enemies. Remember, the hover key is the numpad 6 button for me. This is where we bring all that we've learned together. So, I'm going to hit my toggle view button. I have this set to the R key. You'll notice that we go into the gunner's view. If I press it again, I go back into the third person view. If we press R again and stay in the gunner's view, and now press the sight stabilization key. You'll notice that four horizontal bars appear around the main targeting point. This indicates that the camera is stabilized and the helicopter's camera will lock onto that position as long as the camera remains inside its gimbal limit. However, on the more modern attack helicopters, if we repeat the same process, but place our mouse over an enemy vehicle, you'll notice that we get an additional lock. If we toggle the sight stabilization over an enemy vehicle, it gives us a solid rectangle around the target, and the helicopter will track this vehicle regardless of its movement. The earlier helicopters are unable to do this, and can only stabilize the gunner's sight onto a fixed target. If we press the toggle sight stabilization key again, you'll see that we now have a circle mounted on top of the square. This allows us to move the camera slightly, allowing you to make fine adjustments to the intended impact point. If we press the sight stabilization button again, we will lose track of the individual vehicle and just go back to having a stabilized gun sight. If we wish to remove the stabilization, we can hit the Alt key. This system is most used with laser and SACLOS guided earth -to ground missiles, but can still be used for accurate shooting with machine guns and cannons. This little demonstration of the helicopter's gunner UI is basically 90% of how you get kills with helicopters. You'll find a target on the battlefield, stabilize your gun sight on them, and then try to guide the missile onto the target. Right lads, enough theory, I feel like a damn teacher. Let's get on to the firing line. We'll start with the guns, as they are the most basic, and arguably the least useful weapons, especially on the early helicopters, where you basically only have 7.62mm rounds. These machine guns will basically only tickle the enemy. They did used to be useful in heli arcade battles, where there were lots of AI ground targets such as AAA and howitzers, but this game mode has now been removed from the game. And the most common game mode for helicopters is now ground realistic, simulator, and helicopter arcade assault, where there aren't really any targets for rifle caliber machine guns. Things are a bit better for many American early choppers though, as their guns are mounted on turrets, giving them a little bit of flexibility, but other copters, like the British Scout and the Soviet MI4, have fixed forward firing machine guns, which are practically useless in game. Stepping things up a bit from rifle caliber guns, many helicopters can carry 20mm cannons. The British g can carry a standard reciprocating 20mm gun, while other helicopters, like the AH-1C, can carry a 20mm revolving gun, mounted in a turret. 20mm cannons are a little bit more useful in game, they don't tend to have amazing penetration, but they can annoy an enemy tank, mainly by causing fires and destroying tracks. But they are still a very close range weapon, which leaves you incredibly vulnerable if you try to use these to inflict damage. And for the most useful cannons in the game, we have the 30mm cannons, the Soviets and Americans had different design doctrines for their helicopter armament. The Soviets went with large, powerful guns, where the Americans tried to focus more on sensors and powerful ammunition. For example, the Apache is armed with a short-barreled, low-velocity 30mm chain gun. Kinetically, the performance is pretty poor, but it is armed with a dual-purpose round, giving it 51mm of penetration at all ranges. This means it doesn't need to rely on its kinetic energy to do a lot of damage. This is somewhat the polar opposite of the Soviet doctrine. The Soviets took a 30mm cannon off a BMP-2 and placed it into one of their new attack helis. Both the Ka-50, Ka-52 and Mi-28 variants are armed with a longer barreled 30mm gun. They also use Sable ammunition, which gives them very good penetration but not much damage. We also have several types of gimmicky weapons, such as the American 40mm grenade launchers, as well as the Soviet 23mm dual barrel gun pods. The Mi-24 can comically carry four of these, giving it an insane amount of burst mass. To fire the guns, we have all of our keybinds set to the left mouse button. Remember, with most of the modern helicopters in game, we can also use a CCIP with our guns, 
giving us an accurate marker on screen as to roughly where our rounds are going to hit. Again though, you will not have this on the starting helicopters. Cannons and machine guns though aren't really useful anymore in War Thunder. While they are the most basic of weapons, they aren't really something you need to learn well in order to be efficient on the battlefield. We then also have bombs. Yes, bombs. These are only available to the Soviet helicopters and forces you to get suicidally close to enemy players in order to deploy them. Most of the Soviet helicopters can carry bombs, ranging from 100 kilos to 500 kilos. While most of the Soviet helicopters can carry them, the majority of these helicopters do not have CCIP for the bombs, making them rather hard to aim. But in the world of top tier ground realistic battles, the likelihood of you getting close enough to the enemy team to drop them accurately without being shot down is incredibly low. The ADATs and that German bus thing that I can't pronounce certainly do not want to be your friend. To drop a bomb though, our keyband was set to the 3 key. There is no CCIP button for choppers, but you will get a green bombing indicator, similar to the indicator you get when you are playing planes in arcade battles. We then come on to rockets. Light cannons and bombs, you will still have to get fairly close to the battlefield, but it isn't as suicidal as the two former options. There are two types of rockets currently in War Thunder, high explosive rockets and high explosive anti-tank rockets. They both obviously use chemical warheads, but differ slightly in their use. If we start with the most basic, and they are typically fairly inaccurate with small warheads. Think the Soviet S5Ks or the American Mighty Mouse. While the rockets are still potent if you land a hit, the starter helicopters you will be firing from will not have CCIP, making them fairly hard to aim, meaning that you will usually have to fire a large amount of them before you manage to get a kill. We then have a slight step up in capability with the Soviet S8KOs and the American Hydra 70s. These have larger warheads and are basically just more accurate in general. This obviously helps with the aiming problem, but they still require pinpoint precision hits to effectively kill anything but light targets. We then go even larger, and these rockets are typically only found on the Soviet and Chinese helicopters. Rockets such as the S-24B and the S-130F are much larger than normal. They contain much more explosive filler and are therefore far more powerful, but their large size limits how many of these weapons you can carry. So like all things in war, it's a trade-off. With most of the late tier choppers having CCIP, using the mid tier rockets such as the Hydras is pretty much the way to go. While they are not as flashy as the S24s, you can carry many more of them, and again with that CCIP, you can get reliable kills with very few shots. We then have one last rocket, however this is kind of a hybrid, as it is laser guided. These laser guided rockets are only available on the Turkish premium helicopter available in the Italian tech tree. These rockets, the CIRITs, require you to lock onto a target with the site stabilization key, then laser designate them with the L key, and then fire. These rockets will then guide themselves onto whatever you are lasing, however, they are basically just an American Hydra 70 rocket with a laser seeker in the nose. This means that the CIRITs are very short range and lack any meaningful punch behind them. Think of it as guiding a single Hydra onto a target. While I'm sure in real life having this capability is very helpful, in War Thunder, where most of the enemies are heavily armoured main battle tanks, it is largely a gimmick. That covers the rockets, now on to the main weapon of the helicopters, the Urtagram missile systems. These weapons basically use the same fire procedure as the CIRIT in the last section. We lock onto a target with a sight stabilisation key, if your helicopter has this feature. We then fire, and keep the crosser on the target until the missile impacts. Quick note, firing any laser guided weapons will automatically toggle the laser designator on, so you do not have to do it manually every time you fire. Again, let's start with the basics. Originally, most helicopters in War Thunder had to start with rockets, but some of the new nations skipped them and get the ATGMs from the get go, looking at you, Britain and China. This makes these nations a little bit more friendly than the American, for example, which only has dumbfire rockets. There is one important thing to mention about Urtagram missiles, and that is the seeker limit. To view these, you must have a missile equipped on your helicopter, and then go into the gunner's view. In the rectangle UI at the bottom of the screen, you may see a box inside this rectangle. 
This determines where you have to be pointing your camera in order to actually launch and track a missile. Some missiles have wide seeker heads, while some have quite narrow ones. For example, the American Hellfire has a very wild field of view, which is one of its benefits. On the other hand, the Soviet Chrysanthemum has a very narrow launch window, making it quite difficult to get into a launch position. These seeker head limits are caused by the guidance system of the missile. There are four different types of missiles in War Thunder, at least when it comes to the earth to ground modes. We have SACLOS, or semi-active command line of sight. We have beam riding, which in game is basically just SACLOS plus. We have infrared guided missiles, found exclusively in the German tech tree. And finally, we have the combination of laser guidance and inertial navigation, or IOG. Most nations use SACLOS missiles on their beginner helicopters. This is because this guidance type was the first of its kind in history and the other two were evolutions of this first missile type. The most famous SACLOS missile is the TOW. This has been used by the Americans for years, and when created, was considered one of America's most classified weapons. This missile basically works by tracking a flur in the end of the rocket. The user keeps the reticle on the target, and the computer inside the launcher tries to keep the missile in the center of the crosshair. This bit is just for people who are curious. You don't need a degree in physics, in order to play War Thunder. But it is due to this flare tracking system that makes the tow vulnerable to the Stora system found on the T-90 and T-80UK tanks, as the Stora is an optical dazzler and basically recreates the flare, causing the missile's computer system to get confused and guide the missile in random directions. This was an inherent weakness of SACLOS, so beam riding missiles were created. They act basically the same way as a SACLOS missile, they travel straight towards a target and try to keep centered on the operator's crosshair, but instead of using a flare in the tail of the missile, they follow a laser or radio beam fired by the launcher of the missile. This is why you get a laser warning if you are being targeted by many late tier Soviet missiles, as they are typically laser beam riding missiles. Because these missiles don't use flares, they are unable to be jammed by IR dazzlers and can only be defeated by popping smoke. To block the laser. Examples of these missiles are the Cornet on the BMP-2M and the Vikias on the K-50 and K-52. We then come on to the NATO top tier weapon, the Hellfire missiles. These are the only real example of the laser plus inertial navigation guidance. Basically, the nose of these missiles has a laser seeker, which guides itself onto the laser. Hellfires are known as top down attack missiles though, this is where our inertial navigation guidance comes in. As soon as you launch a Hellfire, it will usually launch into a high arc. When the missile starts to point its nose down, the laser guidance takes over, allowing the missile to make minor corrections to its trajectory. This means during the majority of the flight of the Hellfire missile, you theoretically could turn your laser detonator off if you wanted. As long as you turned it on a few seconds before impact, the missile should still hit its target. This is a pretty good practice if an enemy has an RWR, as turning your laser off means they will not get a warning, at least until the 3 or 4 seconds before the impact when you turn it back on. The three different guidance systems that I've described all have different strengths and weaknesses. For example, the Hellfires by far do the most amount of damage, due to them typically hitting the tops of vehicles, but because of its high flight path, they tend to be very slow actually getting to a target, giving enemy SPAA a long time to kill you before the missile actually hits. This is the reason that the current helicopter meta in War Thunder right now is so focused on the beam riding equipped helicopters. There is a reason that Soviet helicopters are so strong at the minute, and it's basically down to their missiles. They are very fast, and due to them being beam riding, they travel in a straight line towards the target. This cuts down their flight time significantly, allowing them to be competitive with rival SPAAs. They aren't having to sit there waiting for their missiles to hit, like the Apaches tend to do. This is why so many helicopters, especially Soviet ones, are considered overpowered at the minute. But, we aren't done yet. We still have to talk about the IR guided missiles, of which there is only one, the PARS-3 LR. These are basically miniature AGM-65 Mavericks. To use these, point the nose of your helicopter towards the location of an enemy. This is important, as the PARS are large and very heavy, meaning they aren't really that manoeuvrable in flight. Then, get an enemy vaguely in your crosshairs. Now, press the fire or to ground key, 
A square should appear on your screen and lock the enemy target. The missile is now locking onto the heat signature of that tank. Press the fire urtagram button again to fire the missile. After this, you no longer have to do anything. The missile will fly by itself towards the target. You may think that this is overpowered, and on paper it is, but the missiles are slow, unagile, and easily blocked by smoke. And compared to most other top tier helicopters, which usually carry 12 if not 16 missiles, the maximum amount of PARs you are able to carry is only 8. This covers all of the Urtagram missiles currently in the game. While they all differ on their penetration and lethality, they all generally guide and fly the same way, with the minor difference in guidance systems being the only real difference. Most of the top tier helicopters have capable Urtagram missiles, so do not feel like you need to play the Soviets in order to be effective. True, you will likely be most effective with the Soviet gunship helicopters, but you can still tear up the battlefield in an Apache. So we know how to deal with tanks, but how do we deal with planes and other enemy helicopters? Well, for the early starter helicopters, you are basically just forced to use your onboard machine guns as makeshift anti-air weaponry. But in the mid ranks of most helicopter trees, we get access to air to air missiles. Both the Americans and the Soviets equipped their early helicopters with the same air to air missiles found on their contemporary jet fighters of the time. In game, the AH 1Z uses the American AM 9L, and the late model AM 24s use the R 60M. These early air to air missiles are very powerful, but tend to be quite large, limiting the amount you can carry. The more modern helicopters in War Thunder simply use man pads instead of jet based missiles. Man pads, or man portable air defense systems, are shoulder launch missiles intended to be used by general infantry. However, these weapon systems can be added onto vehicles, notably the American LAVAD, German Weasel, and Japanese Type 93. Because man pads are much smaller than jet borne missiles, you can carry far more of them on helicopters. The American Apaches can carry four AIM-92 Stingers, the Soviet K-50 and Mi-28 variants can each carry up to 8 Iglers, and the Chinese helicopters can carry up to 16 of their TY-90 missiles. Both the man pads and jet borne missiles work in the same way. If you hit the fire air to air missile key, you notice a large ring, as well as a smaller ring in the centre of the screen. The smaller ring represents your missile seeker head. You need to put this smaller ring onto the target. Once you do this, the ring will stop flashing and will turn from green to red. If you press the fire air to air key again, the missile will launch. It's that simple. If a target dies, or you no longer want the missile to be turned on, you can hit the weapon lock air to air key. I have this set to the 4 key, and it basically just shuts off the missile. We have two outliers to these air to air missiles. 95% of the anti air missiles in War Thunder work the way I have just described. The exceptions are the British fire streaks and the Soviet Vikia missiles. We'll start with the latter. The Vikias are actually air to ground missiles, but they have a proximity fuse warhead, allowing them to target helicopters and jets as well as tanks. This was very controversial when the K-50 was first introduced, as it could kill anything at a range of 10 kilometers. To use the Vikias, you basically use them the same way you'd use an air to ground missile. Except, obviously, you aim them at a plane or a helicopter. The Star Streaks, on the other hand, are a little bit more complicated. While they are SACLOS guided, like many other missiles in War Thunder, they unconventionally use free darts attached to a rocket. This gives them a lot of benefits. They're incredibly fast, making them both hard to dodge and to counter, but you also have to get a direct hit with them, as there is no proximity fuse. Regardless of this, though, they are still fired the same way we fire any other air to air missile, except you will have to manually guide them onto a target. But how do we protect ourselves from these air to air missiles? Unlike the old days of War Thunder, helicopters are no longer weak in defence. In order to counter other helicopters, as well as anti air missiles, we have several things available to us, three of which are passive systems, meaning you don't have to do anything, and the final one will require your input. Many early Soviet helicopters will get access to something called HIRSS. This stands for Helicopter Infrared Suppression System, or Hover Infrared Suppression System. This basically makes it harder for an infrared seeker or an IR missile to acquire a lock. Once this is unlocked, it works passively, 
but it's only effective against the very early earthworm missiles. You can also unlock the IRCM, or infrared countermeasures. This works like a dazzler. It confuses the incoming IR missile and messes with their guidance system. Again, like the HIRSS, it works passively. But again, it is only very effective against the early earthworm missiles in game. The HIRSS and the IRCM are mainly only found on Soviet helicopters. However, our next countermeasure is found on all nations. These are the flur pods. We can carry both flurs and chaff. However, these do require you to manually deploy them when you see an incoming missile. To do this, press the fire countermeasures key, which I have bound to the F key. And finally, for the most modern helicopters in War Thunder, you can unlock the MOR system. This is a missile approach warning system and it will detect incoming missiles and then deploy flares for you, making the flares a passive defense system as well. This is very effective in game, but as I said, it's only available to most modern helicopters. While you are flying the majority of the early helicopters in game, you are kind of shit out of luck, as you will not know that you are being targeted by an enemy. However, at top tier, where your helicopters have RWRs, you will get a ping telling you that you are being locked by a radar system. This allows you to take early evasive action and will hopefully keep you alive. But there are several air defense systems in War Thunder which use IR guided missiles as well as IRST or infrared search and track which allows you to be targeted without giving you an RWR spike. Because of these systems, you should never get too comfortable hovering in one spot. Just because you are not having an RWR spike or your flurs aren't deploying doesn't necessarily mean you aren't seconds away from going back to the hangar. And that's pretty much it lads, that's everything when it comes to the theory of flying helicopters, the rest is up to you. There aren't many tips I can give to you when it comes to actually flying helicopters in ground realistic, apart from stay low, relocate often and use the environment to your advantage. Are there mountains? Use them. Are there hills? Hide behind them. Modern top tier air defence systems are now essentially a point and click adventure, so flying a helicopter does take a lot of skill. It's no longer anywhere near as easy as it used to be, and you are going to have to be smart when playing them. Instead of taking off from the helipad and going straight up and firing missiles, maybe fly around the side of the map and pop up from where their helicopters would spawn. This would allow you to take the enemy from surprise and might allow you to take out the enemy air defense systems before they spot you. Try to avoid open area and always try to put something between you and the enemy team. Stuff like hills, woodland, buildings, all block radar and prevent you from being targeted by the radar spags. Taking off and just shooting your missiles whilst hovering in the air is just a great way to get yourself shot down. But lads, if you are struggling with ground realistic battles, then try flying in the player versus environment. This is a less harsh environment, but it is a harder ground. It will take much longer, but at least you'll be able to learn how to fly while still earning a good bit of XP and silver lions. Finally, you can also fly out in a custom battle. These battles are fully against AI and you are able to choose whatever map you want. This allows you to test out weapon systems without the risk of losing silver lions in a game. Hopefully this guide has helped you out lads and if it did, please do consider leaving a like and subscribing. If you have any vehicle you'd like to see reviewed or if you'd like to see a tutorial and any other thing in War Thunder, be sure to let me know down below in the comments. I'd also like to thank my YouTube channel members and once again, Thank you very much for watching lads.